Hello, and welcome back to The Barons. Today, we're going to talk about the tragedy that was the Iroquois Theater fire. It was 3.15 in the afternoon on a cold winter's day. Children attended the Iroquois Theater with their mothers, excited to see the production of Mr. Bluebeard. Little did they know that terror was waiting in the form of stage lighting and hanging drapery. The Iroquois Theater was established in Chicago, Illinois on November 23, 1903 on West Randolph Street. With three levels, it housed 700 seats on the main floor, 400 on the second, and 500 on the third. People were assured the theater was fireproof as the Iroquois boasted of its fire safety in its playbills. Merely five weeks into opening its doors, the Iroquois was abuzz with the theatrical telling of a French folk tale called Bluebeard. Children were on winter break at this time, and many mothers took their kids to see the theatrical release. Outside, temperatures were a frigid negative 4 degrees Fahrenheit, with 6 inches of snow on the ground. Around the second act, when ballerinas were on stage dancing to Let Us Swear It by the Pale Moonlight, the curtain caught fire by a spark from one of the arc stage lights. They tried stamping it out, but it did nothing. William McMullen tried to clap at the flame, but it spread too quickly and out of his reach. William Sallers, the theater fireman, tried using kill fire cans, but it had escalated too far. It spread to the wooden props and oily rags behind the stage. Eddie Foy, one of the actors, returned to the stage so as to keep the audience calm and seated. Because of its whopping count of 30 exits, it was supposed to be safe. However, people couldn't find all the exits, as they were not lit or marked because the owners thought it would distract from the show. Some of the exits were even locked, as the owners were trying to prevent people from sneaking in to see a free show. Staff tried to lower an asbestos curtain to quell the fire, but it wouldn't properly lower all the way. And regardless, it turned out the curtain would have had no real use in the fire, according to a chemist who tested its components. Stampedes occurred when the exits opened. Unfortunately, once the back door was opened by the cast and crew, the air caused a fireball to rip through backstage. Many of the locks on the doors were foreign to the attendees and they could not get them unlocked. But Frank Hausman and Charlie Dexter were able to force a few of them open. People became trapped and trampled, even climbing over piles of bodies. Anywhere from about the height of a person to about 10 feet high, as the smoke, trampling, or flames took their lives. Police and firefighters arrived late, as there was no fire alarm connected in the building, and a staff member had to manually pull one at Randolph and Dearborn Streets. When CFD's Engine 13 did arrive, more units were called to the scene. Authorities escorted survivors that had escaped to the diner next door, called the J.R. Thompson's Diner. Volunteer doctors and nurses were there waiting, administering aid. Those who were declared dead were stacked onto the sidewalk for transport. They began to pile up in rows before being placed in the back of wagons to be delivered to morgues. By the time the sun set, which was about 4.30 p.m., there were around 602 dead and 250 injured bodies. All of the bodies were removed from the theater by about 6.30 that same evening. Many of the dead were those who sat on the balcony. It was stated by the coroner that most of the watches worn during the fire had stopped working at 3.50 p.m. The day after the tragedy, the Tribune had this to say, quote, The fire leaped from the stage as if from a furnace door. The draft from the open stage exits behind drove it across the auditorium and upward to the galleries. Over a carpet of the dead, it forced its own way through the chimney of the alley doors on the galleries. End quote. According to the Gutenberg ebook, Chicago's Awful Theater Horror, Eddie Foy said this, quote, I was in my dressing room, one tear up off the stage when I smelled smoke. The moonlight ballet was on, and it was three minutes before the time for my entrance on the first scene of the second act. I looked up and immediately over me, and the left first entrance, I saw sparks and a small cloud of smoke. The members of the company and the chorus had already started off the stage. My eldest boy Brian was standing under the light bridge in the first entrance, and taking him by the hand, I turned him over to one of the stagehands with orders to get him out of the theater. In less time than it takes to tell it, the little wreath of smoke and the tiny sparks had grown in volume. The smoke and some of the sparks had already made their way into the main part of the house, curling down and around the lower edge of the proscenium arch. I looked at the house through an opening, and that was enough. I tried to appear as calm as possible under the conditions, realizing what a stampede would mean. Just what I said I cannot for the life of me now recall. 
In effect, though, this is about it. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no danger. Don't get excited. Walk out calmly. Between each breath, and these were coming in short, sharp gasps, I kept yelling out from the corner of my lips. Lower that iron curtain. Drop the fire curtain. The balcony and gallery were packed with women and children, and fully aware of what was in store for these hapless ones, my heart sank. The cracking of the timbers above increased. The smoke was growing more dense. I knew the material aloft, flimsy, dry linens, parched canvas, and paint-coated tapestries and drops. Without raising my voice to a pitch calculated to alarm and yet unmistakably urgent in its appeal, I repeated, get out, get out slowly. The northeast corner of the fly gallery was now a furnace. Just as I made the last appeal to the balcony in the gallery, a fiercely blazing ember dropped at my feet. Another, a smaller one, was caught in the draft and forced out into the theater proper. Drop the fire curtain, I shouted again, looking in vain for it to come down. I know that not a soul in the theater proper would be in danger if this was done. The switchboard was there, but no one to work it. I cried out for Carlton, our stage manager. He was gone. I called for Pete, one of the electricians. He too was gone. Does anyone know how this iron curtain is worked? I yelled at the mob of fleeing stagehands, members of the company, property men, and musicians. Not an answer. At the first sign of danger, after reaching the footlights, I said to Delia, our orchestra leader, an overture, Herbert, an overture. Delia, God bless him, ranks already thinning out in the orchestra pit, struck up the Sleeping Beauty and the Beast Overture. Of the thirty-odd musicians in the pit, not over half a dozen remained to follow Delia and his baton. But the little fellow, ashen pale, his eyes glued on the raging mass of flame above, never whimpered. He kept right on and only left his post when the flames drove him away from his leader's stand. When Delia disappeared down the opening in the orchestra pit, half of the lower floor had been emptied. This I noticed only in an aside, for my eyes were fastened on the sea of agonized, distracted little ones in the balcony and gallery. End quote. Here are a few of the victims and their tragic stories. Ben and Pearl Gold, seated in the third floor balcony. They left behind a daughter, Dorothy Gold, who was only three at the time and considered too young for the theater. She was then raised by her paternal grandparents. Three high school friends, Helen Bagley, 17, Irene Cummings, 18, and Addie Baker, 16, were seated in the fourth row of the dress circle in the second floor balcony, and they all perished in the fire. The tickets were a gift from Moses Baker for Addie and her friends. Annie Hedges Birch, 32, and her son Arthur James Birch, Jr., 11, were unrecognizable after the event. They were identified only by her rings and the boy's pocket knife. They received a double funeral at the family home. And finally, Mother Mary W. Badenoch Holst and her children, Alan, 13, Gertrude, 10, and Amy, 8. They died trying to reach the fire escape from the second balcony. They were survived by the father and six-month-old son. There were so many more lives lost and so many people who deserve to be remembered. You can always look up the names and their stories online. But that's it for this episode. This event was an interesting read as well as quite the tragedy. As always, if you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you for joining me in the Barrens.